March 27th, Daily Video Bible Reading from the Net Bible, Deuteronomy chapter 19 and 20 from the Old Testament. When the Lord your God destroys the nations whose land he is about to give you, and you dispossess them and settle in their cities and houses, you must set apart for yourselves three cities in the middle of your land that the Lord your God is giving you as a possession. You shall build a roadway and divide into thirds the whole extent of your land that the Lord your God is providing as your inheritance. Anyone who kills another person should flee to the closest of these cities. Now this is the law pertaining to one who flees there in order to live. If he has accidentally killed another without hating him at the time of the accident, Suppose he goes with someone else to the forest to cut wood, and when he raises the axe to cut the tree, the axe head flies loose from the handle and strikes his fellow worker so hard that he dies. The person responsible may then flee to one of these cities to save himself. Otherwise, the blood avenger will chase after the killer in the heat of his anger, eventually overtake him and kill him, though this is not a capital case since he did not hate him at the time of the accident. Therefore, I am commanding you to set apart for yourselves three cities. If the Lord your God enlarges your borders as he promised your ancestors and gives you all the land he pledged to them, and then you are careful to observe all these commandments I am giving you today, namely to love the Lord your God and to always walk in his ways, then you must add three more cities to these three. You must not shed innocent blood in your land that the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance, for that would make you guilty. However, suppose a person hates someone else and stalks him, attacks him, kills him, and then flees to one of these cities. The elders of his own city must send for him and remove him from there to deliver him over to the blood avenger to die. You must not pity him, but purge out the blood of the innocent from Israel, so that it may go well with you. You must not encroach on your neighbor's property, which will have been defined in the inheritance you will obtain in the land the Lord your God is giving you. A single witness may not testify against another person for any trespass or sin that he commits. A matter may be legally established only on the testimony of two or three witnesses. If a false witness testifies against another person and accuses him of a crime, then both parties to the controversy must stand before the Lord, that is, before the priest and judges who will be in office in those days. The judges will thoroughly investigate the matter, and if the witness should prove to be false and to have given false testimony against the accused, you must do to him what he intended to do to the accused. In this way you will purge evil from among you. The rest of the people will hear and become afraid to keep doing such evil among you. You must not show pity. The principle will be a life for a life, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a hand for a hand, and a foot for a foot. When you go to war against your enemies and see chariot tree and troops who outnumber you, do not be afraid of them, for the Lord your God, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt, is with you. As you move forward for battle, the priest will approach and say to the soldiers, Listen, Israel, today you are moving forward to do battle with your enemies. Do not be faint-hearted. Do not fear and tremble or be terrified because of them. For the Lord your God goes with you to fight on your behalf against your enemies to give you victory. Moreover, the officers are to say to the troops, Who among you has built a new house and not dedicated it? He may go home lest he die in battle and someone else dedicate it. Or who among you has planted a vineyard and not benefited from it? He may go home lest he die in battle and someone else benefit from it. Or who among you has become engaged to a woman but has not married her? He may go home lest he die in battle and someone else marry her. In addition, the officers are to say to the troops, Who among you is afraid and faint-hearted? He may go home so that he will not make his fellow soldier's heart as fearful as his own. Then, when the officers have finished speaking, they must appoint unit commanders to lead the troops. When you approach a city to wage war against it, offer it terms of peace. 
If it accepts your terms and submits to you, all the people found in it will become your slaves. If it does not accept terms of peace, but makes war with you, then you are to lay siege to it. The Lord your God will deliver it over to you, and you must kill every single male by the sword. However, the women, little children, cattle, and anything else in the city, all its plunder you may take for yourselves as spoil. You may take from your enemies the plunder that the Lord your God has given you. This is how you are to deal with all those cities located far from you, those that do not belong to these nearby nations. As for the cities of these people that the Lord your God is going to give you as an inheritance, you must not allow a single living thing to survive. Instead, you must utterly annihilate them, the Hittites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, just as the Lord your God has commanded you, so that they cannot teach you all the abhorrent ways they worship their gods, causing you to sin against the Lord your God. If you besiege a city for a long time while attempting to capture it, you must not chop down its trees, for you may eat fruit from them and should not cut them down. A tree in the field is not human that you should besiege it. However, you may chop down any tree you know is not suitable for food, and you may use it to build siege works against the city that is making war with you until that city falls. God, I know that there's so many reasons why you hate it when we worry or are concerned or terrified. Obviously, in the situations we're looking at here, you're concerned that fear and being terrified when they're standing in ranks in the armies will cause the person standing next to them to also become afraid. It's pretty common. Uh, it's pretty easy to catch fearfulness uh, from other people. It's pretty easy to get other people agitated. So one, if they're going into battle, you can't have that. You can't have this fear that's disseminating throughout the ranks. Um, from a military standpoint. But also I know that you don't like us to fear or worry or be terrified because it means we're not obedient to you. It means we're not trusting you. You go on to say in, in a couple books that were further that we're going to get to here soon in Judges, when you're talking to Gideon, you say you have too many men I cannot deliver Midian into their hands, or Israel would boast against me. My own strength has saved me. So in this situation, if you go in on, on your own arrogance, your own bravado into situations, then you honestly believe it's because of you that that situation turned out well, instead of who we know actually <laughs> made sure the situation turned out well, which is you, God. So when we worry or, or we're fearful or we're terrified, we're not being obedient to you. We're not trusting in you. Every day we go into situations that can be fearful, that can be terrifying, that can be overwhelming. And in those moments, God, I just pray for everyone who goes into those situations that they will just take a moment and turn to you. I know that you're with them. I know that you'll take care of it. I know without a, without a shadow of a doubt that you will go into whatever that battle is with them as long as it's in your will. Without, without question, I pray that you give them that insight, that you take away that worry, that fear, that concern, and replace it with obedience, that, that their path becomes yours in whatever situation they're having to deal with. Whether it's a fight with a friend, frustrations at work, perhaps situations in a, in a marriage, Maybe it's even doing something in your ministry, standing up and talking on Sunday about something, delivering something to a small group. Those can be fearful situations as well. But if we rely on you, and instead of our words being what we rely on, that we just turn over those situations to, to you and just say, God, I just want your words to be said during this prayer. I just want your words to be said when I'm talking in front of the congregation. And, and then I know whatever comes out of my mouth will be good and will be what it is that you want me to be saying. That will take away my fear because I'm terrified of what my words will do or not do or how I'll present them. But I know if I let you take over, 
in this situation with my friend, in in a marriage, in a work situation. I know if you if I allow you to take over, if I'm obedient to you, if I'm trusting, then it is your will that per will prevail in those situations, God. For that, I am so incredibly thankful. I'm so thankful for you being faithful and consistent to everyone who's listening. That as they're obedient and trusting in you, that you take over. That you allow, allow your will to prevail over everything. God, I ask for obedience today. I ask for trusting. I ask for worry and fear to just go away. And when those, those situations turn out great, even better than we can imagine, that we also stop and realize that it is for your glorification because it was all you who made sure that those situations turned out the way they were supposed to. God, I just love you so much. In your son's name I pray. Amen. <laughs>